Welcome to the Abyssinian syllabary, where we spell out Ethiopia in 33 characters. I'm Yves Marie Stranger, your host and the compiler of these Abyssinian lives. Nota bene. While any resemblance to actual countries, past or present, and to historical figures is not purely coincidental, this is a work of fiction. To order the book or a poster of the Abyssinian syllabary, visit Ethiopia.com. That's U-T-H-I-O-P-I-A dot com. A Prologue by Manuel de Guz How can one be Ethiopian? For that was ever the urgent interrogation of Jean-Michel Cornu de L'Enclos in the land of the Ethiops, a burning question to which de L'Enclos attempts to provide an answer in the biographical sketches that ensue. The most handsome of men, Homer told us, were the natives of this land of burnt faces, for thus, from the word Aethiops, was the cognomen Ethiopia derived. The land itself in those olden times, was a suitably far away location for the Greek polis. Ethiopia provided, for Herodotus, the place the gods disport themselves to sip mead on the mountains of the moon. And before early historians begin to gossip, apropos the Ishtelfai Gai and the Trogloditi, the brave Perseus will deliver Andromeda on the Red Sea shore from the monster. Cetus, a myth prefiguring St. George slaying the dragon, St. George, the patron saint of England, and, of course, of Ethiopia. How can one be Ethiopian? And what is an Ethiopian? And was there ever such a thing? What is a man for that matter? What is it that makes the fibre of an Englishwoman or an Inuit teenager? Should we still say that in merry England, they prize their ale, and that the maidens are rosy-cheeked, while in Ultima Thule they have a predisposition for whale blubber and like to retire under domes of ice? Of course, in this day and age, Eskimo, English, and Ethiopian alike squeeze out Colgate onto the same acrylic brush. Did Inuits even have teenagers before global warming? began to melt down their abodes of ice? Did the English ever like to dance around maypoles and eat beef stew before making tandoori their national dish? I find it very difficult to pronounce on these matters, composed as they are of equal parts of hearsay and ex post facto thinking. In sooth, the characters of former times are playthings to us, Silhouettes we pin to the stage to demean or enlarge, according to the needs of the day, we are forever reshaping the past in order to mirror what we should like to see today. History is no mere collection of great men, as a great man once said. However, in that case, what we should wish to know is, did that personage like his eggs sunny side up, or would he rather have them soft-boiled? with soldiers on the side? Was he of a quick temper or of an easy disposition? And what made him hold this belief that the greats are not the swivel around which history gyrates? Not, mark you, that I am adamant in seeking out this particular man's odium for his strict wet nurse and make of this early trauma the kernel around which Thomas Carlyle, for it is he, formed his opinions. In reality, these matters are so complex, so entwined with happenstance, that all we can know is that we shall never fully know. Nevertheless, if great characters do not make history, who does then? It should be the unsung multitude. The yeoman built on his plough in not-so-merry England, together with his ailing wife beset by painful childbirth and the Eskimo, who has no taste for snow and pines for sunnier climes. And yes, why not? 
a fair sprinkling of a few illustrious men and women, too, for good measure. Yet, what of the Ethiopian, I hear you say? What of the swarthy Abyssinian and his unique ways and the strange lands he inhabits? The land of Sheba, Solomon, and the Ark of the Covenant. For that is where the Ethiopian lives, as we all well know. I should, at this early juncture, sheepishly confess that I know nearly nothing of this people, nor of the characters that would compose it. Perhaps you will better understand if I say that I could no more vouch for an understanding of George Washington or Diogenes Teufelsrock or Quiqueg, for that matter, any more than I can pretend to be able to read the state of mind of King Theodorus or that of the Lebashai Bariau. For timeless Abyssinia no longer exists. In these last decades, I have seen Ethiopia impelled forward as if speeded up in a motion picture. The land where time stood still, embalmed in poverty, in which you could imagine having sighted a fragment of old Israel and to be walking in the footsteps of biblical prophets, is no more. Encompassed on all sides by the enemies of their religion, the Ethiopians slept nearly a thousand years, forgetful of the world by whom they were forgotten. Two thousand years of history have been steamrolled by power lines, hydroelectric dams, and Chinese gadgets. Ethiopia has decisively strutted onto the world stage, no longer a backdrop for tattered myths, but a powerhouse in the making. And if it does seem that the autarchic kingdom I first travelled to is fast becoming another strand of the same brush that is painting the world of one colour, well, so be it. For if Ethiopia seemed of a biblical essence, and if it did possess something different, it should be underlined that its one defining trait was indigence, famine, low life expectancy, a near total lack of health care, and a dearth of modern education, save for the moneyed elite, which, for peddling stories about biblical bloodlines, was mindful of securing Western scholarships for its offspring while Ethiopia itself, the plot of real estate located in the Horn of Africa, has of course not changed its bearings. The people that live there, the old Abyssinians, are seeking to become less other every day. Today's Ethiopians are more similar, less remote, more likely to eat the same foodstuffs as the rest of humanity than ever before. And this as we take note of those care centers, those plummeting infant mortality rates, is surely a good thing. For if history is not made by the famous, it is made by the multitudes, and multitudes are what define contemporary Ethiopia. The country, numbering less than 15 million people in the time of Emperor Menelik at the beginning of the 20th century, has now more than 100 million citizens with a median age of 18. These new Ethiopians have grown up under the aegis of the fairy electric. They pack smartphones in their pockets. McDonald's and Facebook, Chris Rock and Beyonce are household names. The monster Cetus, Emperor Zeriakob and Queen Mentuab are not. One can therefore wonder not only at the question of what is an Ethiopian, but if there ever were such a thing, for nations are similar to the fabled knife still sharp after 2,000 years, the handle of which was refashioned, then the blade, and this ad infinitum. And yet we would like to believe that we are one and the same with the people of yore. In this view, the English are, at all times, the English, and the Ethiopians are, and always were, the Ethiopians and we continue to carve up our history with this blade, not realizing that it is our own razor-sharp utensil, our inward eye which is forever refocusing on the needs of the present. We only delve into the abyss of time to shed light on our present predicament, 
and I would vouch to say that the English freeholder, the Inuit of Ultima Thule, and the Abyssinian never did exist, or if so, never in any form that we ourselves could possibly unravel. The past is not only a foreign land, it is a country peopled by foreigners. To the query, how can one be Abyssinian? I lay down for you the bare bones of the story of one Zegakrist, an Abyssinian grandee hailed in the literary salons of Paris in the 1630s. It is not clear of how this Zegakrist reached France from his motherland. Notwithstanding, he was very glamorous, and he told all who would listen, and they were many, that he was the true heir to the throne, but had fled after an usurper stole his birthright. We do not in any manner know if the tale recounted by Zegakrist was true. Not that it matters, as the epitaph engraved on his tombstone seems to blithely admit. You can still visit this grave in the cemetery of Rueil, close to Paris. C. G. Zagachrist, King of Ethiopia, the original or the copy. De toute façon, la mort a fini les débats. What has been lain down for posterity, etched in stone, is the story the man held dear together with his bones, which, royal or not, must now be dust. Which is why I can only applaud, with a trifecta of reservations, the worthwhile attempt of Jean-Michel Cornu de L'Enclos to etch a number of Abyssinian lives for posterity, even though I fear the author's approach to some of these characters, hitherto only known for their hagiographies, is somewhat akin to being a bull in the Ethiopian crockery shop. As to the element of veracity, and to whether the characters laid down in these pages were birthed by women of blood and flesh, or whether their hearts pump with ink, this is a moot point, and not a very useful one. De toute façon, la mort a fini les débats, n'est-ce pas? So I shall not wade into the debate upon the mental equilibrium of Emperor Theodoros, or the ethics of the kidnapping of his one and only child. Theodoros had several offspring, some who did rather well in Ethiopia after their father's quietus, save in one respect. Not one of them figures in posterity's roll call. Who sings your praises? Ras Meshesha Theodoros of Dimbia. Who tends to your grave? Princess Altash Theodoros, first betrothed of King Menelik II. Nor shall I quarrel with the likelihood of Sylvia Pankhurst picking up her distaste for democratic politics in the family pantry, although it does seem rather preposterous that the lady ever harboured such a disinclination for universal suffrage, as Mrs. Pankhurst was foremost before becoming an ardent Ethiopianist, an English suffragette and presently occupies a choice position in the western synexarium of secular saints. Much is made of the penchant of characters like the monk Gregorius for, say, such and such an edelpitzketze over some other lump of cheese. It may be true that these inconsequential choices do matter in the moment. It may be true, still, that details such as these shape the character of a man or a nation. One might recall General de Gaulle's outburst that it is impossible to govern a nation in which there are 258 sorts of cheese, or, indeed, Ethiopians' wanted remark, this is our culture, as they lovingly finger their injera crumpet. I would emphasize that many a dinner conversation seems made from what are infinitesimal differences. Perhaps one needs to be French to grant such importance to Kurds in the destiny of a nation. Which brings me to my antepenultimate and perhaps most trenchant censure. 
It should be pointed out that a number of the characters in this Abyssinian syllabary are only Abyssinian par association, a choice which may raise an eyebrow or two in some quarters. What is more, a number of the lives anthologized here, such as Tintin, from the celebrated Tintin and the Alpha syllabary, are walk-ons from the pages of literature. But pace. No library, however obscure, is a universe unto itself. Books placed on the shelves converse with one another. For ink, once applied to the page, is one and the same with blood. Marcel Schwab thought no differently, and neither did Plutarch, John Aubrey, nor, for that matter, I shall venture, does Dame Hilary Mantel. Neither should we falter too long on the pernickety topic of appropriation, since if Ethiopians made the Holy Bible their own, we shouldn't feel any compunction in redrafting some of their best stories. Let's emphasize that by paraphrasing Robert Louis Stevenson. No country ever cornered the market in Apocrypha. If the Ethiopians were able to gift Henoch back to the world, it is because they had borrowed him in the first place. Moreover, if these 33 lives do appear to be sequential, it does not follow that they must be read consecutively. Indeed, you may start with the last before skipping to the first, or a light in the middle, if such is your fancy. For all pasts, once elapsed, are one and the same. There is no more distance between the ascension of our Saviour Jesus Christ and the present than there lies between himself and Lucy, the Australopithecus afarensis, or between an aeon and an instant in time. The past is all of a piece and is buried in one shallow grave. Finally, there is the not-so-trivial matter of the choice of the lives herein compiled to stand in as parts of the whole. Although I would have an occasional quibble, I can only bow to the right of the author as the demiurge of this peculiar Ethiopian cosmogony to prevail. Some of the lives portrayed are peripheral, while others are unfaithful to the portraits we are familiar with. So be it. Eve Marie Stranger, the editor of the work, claims an overarching motive for this collection of Ethiopian lives, a pattern shaped by a dead man's cryptic testament. I shall advise the discerning reader to use their intuition. While the writer may attempt to arraign his readership to serve as postman for the monody they are sending off into the ether, readers may well choose to overlook the morbid heron at hand. They will then simply omit the fanciful encomium altogether. The imagined life of Cornu de l'Enclos, as well as the scatological minded and ascension of Mount Kaka that bookends the fictions. And no one will be the wiser if they do. Readers may even resort to leafing through the handy thumb index and solely use the book as a mnemonic device to commit to mind the 33 symbols of the Abyssinian syllabary. Enough said. I do not wish to pick a bone with the worthwhile endeavour of the compiler. Yves Marie Stranger is himself an amateur Ethiopianist of minor repute. For I do believe that this slim volume provides some vital elements of response to the interrogation of Jean-Michel Cornu de l'Enclos, limbed in the question, how can one be Ethiopian? Suffice to say that with the easement of Mr. Stranger's handiwork, Cornu de l'Enclos' syllabary is a broad, unorthodox church, and and all the more vivid one for it. For all this talk of bygone eras, it does not follow that these figments from the past, as imaginative as they may be, do not exist in the here and now. 
In fact, paradoxically, the present is the only place where the dramatis personae of the past ever do take form, for the past only lives on in the living. Likewise for countries such as Abyssinia, which are said to no longer exist, I should know. I have sojourned there for many a year myself. Manuel de Goes.